that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the
Good morning. Good morning, Emmanuel. This morning, we are called to worship. And that call to worship comes in the form of a prayer. Please bow your heads as I read from Psalm 86. Hear me, Lord. And answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord. For I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord. For I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to the cry of my heart. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is no one, none like you. No deeds can compare to yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. And they will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Amen. Consider all the works thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, I say. I hear the 
sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul. Son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Savior God to me, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul. sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. Thank you. Um, absolute fitting song as we move into uh, Trinity Sunday, this Sunday where we focus on the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, um, and, and talk about what it means to state what we believe and, and why that means something. Um, so those are kind of the flavor that you'll see as we go through the service. Also an absolute fitting song as we um, are off the heels of losing our brother Warren on Friday. Um, we've been in prayer for him and Glenda and Miguel and the family and... Um, Part of that prayer was for healing. Part of that prayer was for, um, if that wasn't in God's doing, then, then more time with his family. But then also part of that prayer was that it wouldn't be a long, drawn-out, uh, painful passing. And um, it wasn't. And in all things, we praise the God who has called his son home to be in his presence. And so um, we'll continue to pray for the family, and we rejoice at this time as well. Um, a few announcements that I want to just uh, let you know is after the service today, uh, 10 minutes after the service, you should have a link already in your email. Uh, we have our all-congregational all meeting, and so we're going to be uh, looking at the budget and approving those things, and we'll be doing some, some other reflections and um, deacons and elders. Uh, it's our time to, to um, affirm those as you guys have sent in that information. So after the service, grab another cup of coffee, maybe... 
grab some snacks, I don't know, and then join us back on that other link. Um, a couple other reminders, we still are doing prayers on Wednesdays at 9.30, and we're still working through the book of Nahum on Thursdays at 9, so please join us for those. Those Zoom links should be sent to you already. Um, continue to watch your emails for church announcements and notifications as we're hoping to meet soon, and whatever restrictions we are continuing to be given um, and, and to meet those, so continue to look at those. And um, it, it has come to my attention that um, we had some anniversaries. We have 40 years by Dean and Judy, and that's a wonderful, if you have Facebook, you can actually see um, these young kids before us. Same with Terry and Sherry, they put theirs up as well. And it's great to, to not only see those special days, but then to look at them and go, oh, I see that kid in you. You look like so-and-so. <laughs> so it's actually uh, enjoyable. And then I know that uh, Mark and Janelle also had a, uh, an anniversary here shortly as well. So um, a testimony, testament, testimony to, to love and dedication. And so congrats. Dean walked away. So, but congrats to you and, and everybody else and your love and, and sacrifice in there. Um, if you want to stand, I'm going to give a blessing, and then we're going to keep on worshiping. So I assume you're standing now if you want to, and you can hold out your hands if you want as well. But grace and peace from God on high to his beloved children, from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Blessed 
This morning, we'll be reminded about our amazing God and Savior and the Spirit that lives within us. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That, that I, I am not, not my own, own but belong, belong body and soul. And soul. In, in life and in death, to, to my faithful, faithful Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Yeah. 
Jesus, I call you to go. The rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you in trouble to bless and sanctify to you your deepest distress. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall Please join me in a time of prayer. Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator of all, Redeemer of this kingdom of yours, Unifier and Sanctifier, we come before you knowing that whatever need we have, Lord, you hear that the path that we are on is not unknown to you. Now, wherever we go, Lord, you are with us. And we praise you for your faithfulness, the fact that you hold to your covenant while we disobey it. We praise you for your love and your grace and your mercy. That your love abounds, that it is timeless. It is above all and in all and through all. Father, hear our prayers. Lord, we come before you still dealing with this disease and pandemic. We come you, to you knowing that you could end this if you so willed. And why it continues on without you doing so, we don't know. And yet our response to all of this is that we will continue to love and serve and encourage that we will lean into you and not the fear that abounds. So give us wisdom during this time on how to respond, how to lead, how to serve. Continue to be with all those who are on the front lines. Keep them safe. Keep them strong. Be with their families as they too have been sacrificing. Father, we think of all the harm that has been caused and all the division that is going on in not only our country but around the world. There are protests here. There are protests in other places as racism still abounds. Division is still a way of life. Lord, gather us in every child, every tongue, every nation, every skin color. Remind us that we are one. 
that you are the creator of every single human, every animal, every tree, every mountain. It's all the work of your hands. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Father, once again, we think of the Bransma family. We think of Glenda and Miguel and the rest of the family as they continue to try to figure out what this looks like without Warren. The family has changed. This soft giant of a man is no longer with us. But not only the family mourns, Lord, this church family mourns as well. He's our brother. And while we praise you for calling him to you and restoring a broken body and life into eternal glory where he worships you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he joins the saints who have gone before him, Lord, he leaves the family here. And not only is that hard, but today would have been his birthday. But what a joy to experience this day in your glory. Surround this family, Father, with your presence. And Father, we come before you knowing that we have some church work to do after the service, that we have a budget to pass, that we have a conversation to have about daycare, that we get to thank Faye and David and Christy and Dean for faithful service as deacons and elders, sacrificing time and energy and family time. We thank you for their three years. May they find rest from that time. And we look forward, Lord, to, to who you are calling to take their place in the three years that they will give and sacrifice to your bride. And so while we meet to do the church's business, we know, Holy Spirit, that we, you are leading your bride towards the hearts of the Father and the Son to do their will of goodness and love and mercy and faithful learning and teaching and stewardship and sacrifice. Lord, we praise you for who you are, what you have done, and who you have called us to be. That through you, our triune God, we understand what it means to live into the kingdom come today. That while broken, while sad and in grief, we rejoice knowing that each and every day you draw us closer each and every day. We take one breath closer to you and one breath further away from the brokenness and sin that we have created. And it is to you we give all honor and glory and praise. And all God's children said, Amen. I will assume you said, Amen with me. Um, so we are, we, we've spent a couple of weeks now working through a few different things. So typically we like to work through a series. We'll do an Old Testament book series. Um, we'll do a New Testament series. Um, and then we do something kind of thematic. And, and right now we're, we're kind of thematic, but we're not really, we're, we're kind of following the church calendar at this time. Uh, next week we'll, we'll spend four weeks in four different psalms as um, trying to flush out COVID and uh, the response that we should have during this time. Uh, which I know is a massive undertaking, uh, but that's for next week. We're going to focus on that next week. Um, but today, so we've kind of been focusing on this sandwich of an Oreo, uh, if you will, of these really beautiful truth statements and hopes and thankfulness. Uh, two weeks ago, we, we focused on Ascension Sunday, and um, the, that Jesus started working from home, that he left us and went to his throne on high. And, uh, and last week, we looked at Pentecost, and the indwelling of the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit coming down, and it was more of a 
it, will, it was. It was a 101 on who the Holy Spirit is and what he does and these different attributes that hopefully encourage us to understand there's so much that he does. And some of the things I didn't cover that I wanted to cover, um, you know, everything we read in the Old Testament, every word that is prophesied, every good that is done, everything that you do today that is out of goodness is because the Holy Spirit is prompting and moving and doing that uh, for you and through you. Uh, but today, today we kind of look at the, the last cookie of that Oreo, or maybe I was kind of thinking it's a BLT, just minus the L and the T, so more like a bacon sandwich, which is the most appropriate sandwich in all the world. And, and we're going to look at um, Trinity Sunday. So today is Trinity Sunday, and uh, we're going to be hopefully reminded of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and what that means. Um, and we're going to look at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, um, but we're not going to break down that text. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different today as we work through what is it you believe and what is it you articulate and why is that important. And so the, the text from Matthew is more of a support system um, than, our, than our focus. So let's actually read these four verses. Five. I had to count on my hands. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. You will never forget how to count in kindergarten. You've got to use your fingers. Uh, so let's read Matthew 8, 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Draw us close Open up our hearts and our minds. Help us to work through what it means to declare what we believe and why it is important. Lead us towards your heart. Remove us from the heart of our own. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So I want to start off by looking at Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day, number seven, question and answer 22 and 23. Uh, it really is a helpful understanding of, of, of our text today, of what we believe and how to declare what we believe. And so we have a lot of slides that I'm going to kind of read through, and so you can say along with me uh, as you would like. So we're going to read through these, these questions and answers. So um, I think, what must a Christian believe? All that is promised us in the gospel, a summary of which is taught us in the article of our universal and undisputed Christian faith. So that's the first question. Lord's Day 23. What are these articles? And you'll, you'll recognize this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen, as the catechism would end there. So as I read these questions and this statement, I really think the best way to begin this conversation on Trinity Sunday is to ask that simple question that is before you on the screen, like somewhere right here. What do you, oh, it's over here. What do you believe? What do we believe? Maybe we even need to, to begin with something even simpler. What is belief? Well, belief, uh, I think a lot of times we kind of tether it to faith, but it's, it's different than faith. 
They're, they're very similar and they work together, but it is different. Faith is active and nonverbal at times, whereas belief can be explained and articulated and talked about and discussed. Belief happens when you see. So for an example, the blind man had faith, which is why he is healed, and belief happened when he saw. So belief, in in a lot of ways, is kind of like knowledge. One author writes, the thief on the cross near Jesus did not have time to learn very much, but he did believe everything the Lord Jesus told him, and so it must be with all true believers. So if we recall, the, the thief on the cross declared the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, with me, you will be in paradise. And this is what we have in our Matthew text, a brief belief statement, a foundation, if you will, as well as this declaration of what you believe. And if you believe, this is what you must do. It's carried out in your actions. And the challenge of this text is that understanding that we as believers must be ready to make an account of what we believe and then act accordingly. That's the great commission of Matthew 28. And it's the beginning of the Apostles' Creed, which we read, which was uh, question and answer 23. And so when you teach others to obey everything Christ has commanded and did, then you are also declaring who he is. So in that understanding, you and I begin to live out what we believe. And what we believe is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the book of Matthew, we're at the tail end. This is literally the end of Matthew. And these verses become this stamp of approval to the whole rest of what the book has been declaring. It's as if Christ is saying, everything you've seen me do, everything you've heard me say is truthful and factful and and meant for everyone. So you cannot and must not keep this within. This is to be shared and given to others. This is a gift bestowed upon more than just you. So how do you make nations of all, how do you make disciples of all nations? You teach everyone. You love them. You show them the path. You show them Christ which is the whole point of the Gospel of Matthew. So if we remember, Matthew is a Jew writing to Jews about understanding and declaring that Christ is the Messiah. So if we go all the way back to the beginning of Matthew, we see this beautiful genealogy, and it ends right there with Jesus as it follows the line of David. Matthew is declaring Christ is the one they had hoped for. And so if you're going to share anything, you need to share the Son, the anticipated one. And it's beautiful because Jesus is also declaring that these disciples then and to you and I today, our path will include all nations, not just Israel. That they were to make disciples by proclaiming the truth concerning Jesus. It's the charge Jesus gave and the message he declared. And then Christ saying that not only will I be with you, but the Holy Spirit will be with you to the end of the ages. This is a charge to not only disciples, but to the church. And it makes sense that this is one of the most popular verses in all of Scripture. This is the sending verse that we so often use when we're sending out missionaries. Many Christian organizations that are doing good work and will around the world use this as their statement of belief, their statement of faith. It's their foundation that they tether themselves to. Because it's a great summary and beginning of faith and belief. The teaching of Jesus recorded in Matthew are the basics of the practical teaching we are to pass on to new disciples. Now, clearly there is more to be said, and and there, there is said in Scripture, but this text was never meant, this great commission, and even the Apostles' Creed, which we'll talk about, was never meant to be the end all to end all. This is the beginning, this is the the foundation of a beautiful structure of faith and belief. So for example, John 20, 30 through 31 states that Jesus did many other signs and activities in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But they are written here so that we can come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That he is the Son of God, that through believing we may have life in his name. And the Apostles' Creed does the exact same thing. It's the same manner. Obviously, there are other things that 
Christ said and did that we should abide by and live into other things that are outside of what the Apostles' Creed is, neither of them are to be that once and for all. It's the basics of what we believe. Now, obviously, within a foundation, you have little nuggets of information that point to something bigger. So these five verses summarize the major themes of the gospel. We have Christ's divine sovereignty. We have his divine authority. We have the nature of discipleship, the scope of the Christian faith, the importance of doing the will of God and the promise of Christ's presence being with his followers in all that they do. In verses 18 through 20, we actually have reference back to Matthew 1, 23, that Jesus will be called Emmanuel, God with us. This great commission section gives the believers their task in life. And if this is your task in life, then you better believe that you better know how to declare it. Because this is the passing of the torch. And that task, that passing of the torch, is to then pass it on and pass it on. It's to duplicate yourself. Make more believers, make more disciples. And to do this to the ends of the earth, every part of the world. And it does so by giving the believer, the disciple maker, a foundation of belief. And I absolutely love those last words, that Christ is not only is not here, but he is here. That he may seem like he's gone, but his presence is here. And he promises to be with them, spiritually to strengthen and empower. The focus is on Christ, for even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. And this is great, but the question still remains, how do I do that? How are, how are we going to do that? What are you going to say? And that response is important because we have a charge here. If we are charged with going and making disciples of every nation, how do you do that? What do you say? Where do you even begin? And I say that because it can get kind of muddy. Matthew uses this word terion in, in Greek here, and it means to observe. But the root is also meant to keep on or continue in a state or guard and keep watch over and even obey, which really starts to make sense because this terion is, is used in reference to what Jesus has given them. He's taught them. So he's telling them to keep on sharing what I have given you. Observe the things that I have told you. Continue on, guard, watch over it, and share. Go down the path that is before you. And I am with you always. But again, how do we do that? Well, we study scripture. We do what we are called to do and we believe it wholeheartedly. The catechism asks a simple question and yet it's in depth. What must a Christian believe? And like any good belief statement, it gives a simple foundation. The gospel, first and foremost, and then what is taught in the universal and undisputed Christian faith. So the two writers, Ursinus and Olivanus, the writers of the Heidelberg Catechism, and I don't know if I've stated it before, but every time I see Olivanus, I always think of Harry Potter, like he was the guy who did the wand shop, but that's not him. Um, but we believe that there, we have these Apostle Creed as these articles, a simple statement backed by Scripture as to what we believe. It's a foundational belief statement. Our text that Jesus gives is our starting point, the basics. And so when someone says, hey, what do you believe in? This is what we can state. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And that's important because things can get a little muddy. So back in 1939, in Iowa, there was a judge, and he was faced with this confusion that confounds, I think, a lot of different believers. There was a medical doctor who had passed away, and he willed $75,000 to his estate with the provision that to persons who believe in the fundamental principles of the Christian religion and in the Bible and who are endeavoring to promulgate 
the same. So that was his words. To persons who believe in the fundamental principles of the Christian religion and in the Bible and who are endeavoring to promulgate the same. So 10 of his nephews and nieces all went to court to break it. Witnesses testified on both sides and one of the doctor's friends that the definition of faith is given in the Apostles' Creed was the intention of the will. But that did not dissipate the confusion because many ministers and a Roman Catholic chaplain testified that theologians are not quite in agreement on what that means, on what the Christian fundamental principles are. The judge didn't know what to do, and so he stuck the middle. He took two weeks to weigh the evidence and came up with a decision. What is the Christian faith was what he struggled with. And so the will was broken up divided amongst all of them, the 75,000 then, which would have been 1.3, almost $1.4 million today. What does it mean to be a Christian? What is it that you believe? And it's a struggle because there are a lot of things that are out there that tell you what you should believe. There's a lot of things that are out there in the Christian faith that believe differently. Some say when we break bread and drink the cup that this is the body and this is the actual physical blood of Christ and the elements. We do not. When we baptize, some say one thing while others say another. We do infant baptism. Some say we shouldn't do that. Some completely dunk people. Some sprinkle. What are you supposed to believe? A new believer today is inundated with so many different understandings of what that is. There are cults, there are movements, there are groups, there are sects, and there are churches. A 2010 study found that there are roughly 350,000 religious congregations that are open at any given time. That's a lot of churches. Of those 350,000, 314 are Protestant and other. I'm not sure what other means or why I'm doing that. 24,000 of those are Catholic or Orthodox. 12,000 are non-Christian. In 2006, they found that there were 217 different denominations of Christianity. But obviously, there could be more or less. So if we take those 217 different denominations, then a new believer is going to have a lot to take in. In Fort Collins alone, I did a quick search, there are 248 listings of places of worship. They'll even show you which are the top 30. I don't even know what that means. I don't don't even know how you say who's the top or how you even get on that list. But it's overwhelming to people. This is why it becomes even more important to have a foundation of your faith that you can state your belief, your creed, and actually know what it is and not just spew out what someone else says or, be able to, or just say something and not actually be able to back it or, or to have a conversation about it. And so I mentioned this word a couple times, creed. What is a creed? Creeds are summaries of what we find in Scripture. It's what we as a body of believers believe. Christianity Today said a creed holds leaders accountable, defines the boundaries of church membership, and tells the world what the church stands for. It's a simple statement of Christian belief based on a theological understanding of the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament as well as the the Old Testament as well. And as stated before, and just like Matthew's text, Creeds are not meant to cover the whole gamut of Scripture. As we look through the the Apostles' Creed, as we look at the Great Commission, there's no conversation about Scripture or inspiration or prayer or the sacraments. But what it does is it sets forth a few words distinct and easily remembered. The existence and relations of the three persons of the Godhead those facts and truths on which all doctrine and duty rest. They do help us with what we believe and help us state what that belief is. They help us put things into terms and unite people. God the Father of creation. God the Son and our deliverance. 
God, the Holy Spirit, and our sanctification. This is what the Apostles' Creed states. This is what we find in fewer words in the Great Commission. And it's what all of Scripture declares. We believe in God the Father, that he created the heavens and the earth. Because we read it in the openings of Genesis and we say that God created this. If he created all of this, then he created everything. He is the Father. Everything comes from him. He upholds everything and rules them all with his counsel and providence. And we see this throughout the Gospels. For if you believe that Jesus states that, then you believe that God is the Father, for that is what Christ declares. As a father provides, so does God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And if you want to know about Jesus, you want to know more about Jesus, then you read the Gospels. But you can also go back to Genesis 1 and begin to understand who Christ is. He may not be mentioned, but it's all about him. But we go to the Gospels and we look at what he did what he said, how he lived, how he acted, how he challenges us to live that same life. You read the epistles, the letters, and you see the prophecy of him throughout the Old Testament. And you find that he left his throne on high and came to earth to die for our sins so that we might be brought to him pure and radiating in glory for eternity. It's what our brother Warren is now living into. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the presence of God with us, that he is God, that he comforts us, that he drives us, that he convicts us, that he sanctifies us, that he takes the work of the Son and he applies it to our lives, that he gives us peace and hope, that he opens up scripture so that we can understand it and we could know it as he draws us and points us to the Father. We believe in the community of believers, the unified church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. We have with us the forgiveness of sons done of sins done by Christ and felt through the Holy Spirit. That forgiveness and love and direction is all at work by the Holy Spirit. And again, if you believe what Jesus states and what happens, then you have to believe in the Holy Spirit, which once more brings us back to Scripture. So what is it that you believe? Romans 1.6 states that the object of our faith is the whole point. Our faith, no matter how sincere, will be sincerely mistaken if it trusts in something other than the gospel. The gospel, after all, is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. And the gospels declare Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.8 and 2.8 state that everything written in the story of Christ and the Christian faith is found in the gospel. That's why Paul suffered for it. This is what the Apostles' Creed states. But there's another reason why creeds are important. There's another reason why we should be able to understand and articulate what we believe, especially when we take into consideration how many churches are out there, how many different ways there are to do things. Author Randall Working states, the church is not infallible. It is a sinful institution like any other human institution. The church does provide tremendous help in discerning the essential stuff of the Bible. It does so through the creeds and confessions, the great historic faith statements of the church. These creeds and confessions help us to focus on the main point of what we believe. This is why the Apostles' Creed has been so strong. This is why the Great Commission becomes this sending ministry for us. Because it all points to Christ, it all points to the Father, it all points to the Spirit. The Bible is a big book, but you can't find a lot of the themes that you may be looking for, but you can find main themes, really important ideas. One could spend a lifetime sifting through all that is here, writing stuff down and trying to absorb its truth and grasp its complexity. 
So when you talk to people and they ask, what is it you believe, or they talk, you talk to people and they say, what does it mean to be a CRC person? What is it exactly that you believe? Then you come back to your faith statement, your belief statement, your creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the one who created the heaven and the earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, who descended to hell. On the third day, Christ rose again from the dead and ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where he will come to judge all people. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of of the body and the life everlasting. You want to know what I believe, that's what I believe. There's a whole section in the Heidelberg Catechism because of this as a Christian, this must be my belief statement because it's a brief summary of the teachings of the gospel. And so the challenge is to take it to heart, to live out this great commission that says to go and make disciples, sharing who the Father and the Son and the Spirit are verbalize it. To simply state, I believe in the Bible, well, that's a decent start, but how do you articulate that to someone who doesn't know the Bible or who doesn't know what the Bible says? So you have to have a summary, and a summary is, is we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then we have an opportunity to break down those even further to what they mean, which is why last week I felt it was so important to talk about a Holy Spirit 101 We are called to share the gospel and the love of Christ. And Christ speaks of the Father himself as the Son and the Spirit, and he promises that he is with you always. And so we go out and we share to the glory of our triune God. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, you have given us the glorious gospel of our risen Savior and Master. Grant that as we joyfully receive the good news for ourselves, that we may gratefully share it with others. And ever glory to you, by whose grace alone we are what we are. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation, we believe, we believe. Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He's conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. In this broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. new life. We believe in 
in the crucifixion. We believe that he's conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems. Greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptation. He's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live loud. Our God will say, We believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God has torn the veil. And we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe. God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He's conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back, He's coming back again. love of God, the love of the Son, and the love of the Holy Spirit go before you to lead you and guide you and send you in His name. Amen. We'll see you in 10 minutes. we bring is more than songs that we sing it's a reflection of our ever-changing lives the best we have to offer we don't just lift up our hands Lord we lift up our lives for we know that you are worthy of our praise to you our lives are darkness we are walking in marvelous light for we are children of the
Spirit. 